spoke a word you were singing over me. You have been so, so good to me. For I took a breath and you breathed your life in me. You have been so, so kind. Yeah. 
search the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and treasures that fade are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Nothing is better than you I know it's true So I'm not afraid To show you my weakness My failures and flaws Lord, you've seen them all And you still call me free Is the God of the valley There's not a place Your mercy and grace Won't find me again Oh, there's nothing Better than you There's nothing Better than you, Lord There's nothing Better
good morning and welcome. Glad to have you back here at Nags Head Church. Um, after last week's series conclusion, now is the time. Next week we start a new series about living like a child of the King. Um, I'm going to do just a little one message, short little thing, uh, addressing the issue of the return of Christ. Uh, are we near the return of Christ? Uh, for the Christian, uh, the return of Jesus Christ is what Paul called our blessed hope. So we look forward to it. Yet there are a lot of current events, things like a pandemic, lawlessness in the streets, a Middle East peace agreement between Israel and their Arab neighbors, a volatile economy, all, those, all these things that are happening right now in our country and in our world are causing some to raise up their, their antenna, if you will, and say, hey, the end is near. And so this morning I want to talk about if it is and, uh, and maybe when is the end of times, the uh, return of Christ. So I want you to hang on. I, I'm going to briefly answer some pertinent questions that uh, I think inquiring minds want to know. And after that, I'm going to finish with a most important, <clears throat> excuse me, a most important question for all of us. I first heard that Jesus was coming back when I was a 10-year-old boy. I'll never forget it. Although I was brought up in churches, I, and not all churches in reality proclaim the gospel. Uh, they don't talk about the return of Jesus Christ. And uh, so I never heard about it till I was 10. But we began to attend this little Baptist church in Jacksonville, North Carolina. In the summer of 1966, Pastor Kirk preached a series of messages on Christ's second coming. And, and I, as I listened, I was fascinated by it. I was also, to tell you the truth, fearful of it. And I remember him preaching from this passage in Matthew chapter 24. I want to begin reading verse 37 down through verse 39. Matthew 24. Jesus said, As the days of Noah were, so the coming of the Son of Man will be. For in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah boarded the ark. They didn't know until the flood came and swept them all away. As the days of Noah were, he said, that's what it's going to be like when I come back. Well, what were those days like? Like It sounds from what Jesus said, I don't see anything bad in there. It sounds like normal life was going on. He said they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. Life was going on, just living life. So what was causing God, what was up with God, that he was so angry that he caused a universal flood that wiped out all of humanity, but Noah and his family? Well, you have to go back to Genesis, the story of Noah, the story of the flood, to get that answer. So let's do that. Go back to Genesis chapter 6, and I'm going to read down verses 5 through 8. Then the Lord saw that man's wickedness was widespread on the earth, and that every scheme his mind, man's mind, thought of was nothing but evil all the time. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And then the Lord said, I will wipe off from the face of the earth mankind whom I created, together with the animals, creatures that crawl, and birds of the sky, for I regret that I made them. And then this one little add-on to what God said, Noah, however, found favor in the sight of the Lord. The sinful nature of mankind prior to the flood was, was unchecked, and human behavior is described as wickedness here and evil all the time. And it reminds us of a principle that's all throughout the Bible, throughout creation. It started in the Garden of Eden, and that is very simply, God must, God has to judge sin because he's holy and he's just. And he did so by wiping humanity off the face of the earth and starting over with this one man's family. Jesus said, talking to his disciples, he said, when it gets to the place where God says again, that's enough. It will be the time for Christ's return. Wickedness and evil are rampant right now, I would say. So we have to ask the question, are we in these days? Are, are we in these last days? What are the end times? 
End times and last days are biblical terms that encompass the time from Christ's first coming, born in Bethlehem, from his first coming until the end, until the end, if you will, of the book of Revelation. So we can say, I think legitimately, we've been living in the end times and last days now for 2,000 years. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 says, In these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. God has appointed him, Jesus, heir of all things, and made the universe through him. But know this, difficult times will come in the last days, for people will be lovers of self, Paul wrote to Timothy. Lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, without love for what is good, 2 Timothy 3. First Peter, Peter wrote, he, speaking of Jesus, was chosen before the foundation of the world, but was revealed, he said, at the end of times for you. So, first question, are we in the end times? Are we in the last days? The, Jesus' first coming was the beginning of the end times or the last days. The day the church was born, the day of Pentecost, the story is found in Acts chapter 2. Peter quoted a prophecy found in the Old Testament prophecy of Joel in verse uh, chapter 2, verses 28 through 32. And Peter quoted it this way, And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my Spirit on all humanity, and then your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. Well, on that day... That day of Pentecost, 50 days after uh, Jesus was crucified, on that particular festival in Jewish history, what we call the church age began. And it will continue until the Lord removes the church and takes all who know him to be with him in heaven. So to answer the question, we are in the end times right now. Another Bible phrase for the apocalypse, which comes from the Greek for the word revelation, Another Bible phrase is the day of the Lord, frequently used in the Old Testament. You could find references to that day, which is actually not a day, like a 24-hour day, but a period of time, uh, mostly what we think of as the tribulation ending in the coming of Christ. And it's found in Revelation chapter 20, that phrase, Zechariah 14, Exodus, excuse me, Ezekiel 39, and all through Joel and all through the minor prophets. So the Bible has plenty to say, has lots to say about the end of times. So the question, one of the questions that we need to ask as we think about the return of Christ is this. Did Jesus promise that he would return or is this something the apostles made up? Well, he did promise he, re he would return. Not only back in Matthew 24 when he said that's what it's going to be like when the Son of Man comes. Not only did he promise it all throughout Matthew 24, but a passage that's so familiar to you and me. If you've ever been to a funeral, you've probably heard this passage read uh, quoting Jesus. John 14, 1 through 3, he said, In my Father's house are many dwelling places. If not, I would have told you. I'm going away to prepare a place for you. And if I go away and prepare a place for you, I'm leaving. If I leave and go prepare a place for you in my father's house, I will come back and I will receive you to myself so that where I am, you may be also. Now we hear that a lot at funerals, but it's really not a funeral passage. Jesus wasn't focusing here on somebody's death. He was focusing on our resurrection as his return. Well, then did Jesus give us clues to when he would return? Did he say, you know, look for this and look for that, kind of like handing out clues, like a puzzle? And the answer is, yeah, quite a few of them. In Matthew chapter 4, for example, let me give you some of the clues that Jesus gave in Matthew 24. He said, imposters claiming to be Messiah would be deceiving many. There would be wars and rumors of wars. There would be earthquakes and famines. There would be persecution of his disciples. There would be lawlessness that would multiply. He said the gospel will be proclaimed in all the world. The temple in Jerusalem would be profaned. And we have to stop and say, but there is no temple in Jerusalem. We'll come back to that maybe in a little bit. 
The great tribulation, he said, would take place unlike anything from the beginning of the world. False prophets performing great signs and wonders would arise, deceiving believers. And he said Israel, the nation of Israel, would be reborn as a nation as he gave what we know as the parable of the fig tree. That's all in Matthew 24. Well, did he give clues then to when he would return? And the answer is he did, absolutely. Well, guess what? With the exception of the one about the temple being profaned in Jerusalem, being desecrated, we could easily use our imagination and look at that list and say, well, all those things are happening right now. And I think Christians have been saying that for centuries. All these things we can look at and say, those are going on right now. There's always been wars and rumors of wars. There have always been earthquakes and famines. There have always been deceivers and those proclaiming to be Messiah. They're going, you say, well, they're going on right now. I've heard it said, however, that the only prophecy yet to be fulfilled in all the prophecies in the Bible of Christ's second coming, the only one that has not been fulfilled, I've been told, is the rebuilding of the temple. And any time, and it does every so often if you watch your news, <clears throat> any time a story comes out of Jerusalem, and Jerusalem is key because the temple's in Jerusalem. Jerusalem is key because the, where the temple was, Solomon's temple, uh, the, was destroyed, and, and uh, the Muslims built a, their own temple there, a mosque, on that spot. And so whenever we hear about Jerusalem and the Jews and Jerusalem being taken over by the Jews and the Jerusalem being recognized as the capital of Israel by the United States and all these news things, the anticipation level in a lot of people begins to rise. There are numerous signs of the time that indicate we are drawing closer, if not close to Christ's return. And some of those signs uh, involve Political things involving nations. I remember hearing years ago when I was probably a teenager, not too much longer after that, when the European Union, the European Common Market, as it was known then, was being formed, that it was, and there were 10 nations, I think, that were needed according to the scriptures, that it was the revived Roman Empire that's spoken of in, in Daniel and, and in Revelation. And of course, the Roman Empire, however, wasn't just European. The Roman Empire included Northern Africa, the Middle East, and Asia all the way to India. There was the Six-Day War in June of 1967 when Israel captured the Sinai Peninsula and the Golan Heights uh, bordering Syria. They retook that area. They overpowered far superior forces in Egypt and Jordan and Syria. And many saw that back in 1967 Many saw that as a sign the second coming was imminent. The Yom Kippur War in 1973, I remember that time well. I was a freshman in college, and in a Christian college, it became quite the talk, quite the subject. It was over the same territory that had been fought over in 1967, and that, however, the difference was it also drew in the United States supporting Israel and Russia supporting Syria. And because these two nuclear superpowers, Russia and the U.S., were involved, many preachers were saying, look, it's coming. Many were saying this is about to usher in the tribulation. In fact, anytime there are rumblings in the Middle East, and there are often rumblings in the Middle East, especially in the months of September and October, which those who predict Christ's return they see those months as being key because of the Jewish holidays that, that are in those months of Yom Kippur and Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets, that raises the anticipation amongst many people that Christ is coming. So the question is, can we know when he will return? He promised it. The Bible speaks of it. Jesus promised it. He gave clues all about it. Can we know when it's going to happen? In Acts chapter 1, Jesus is about to ascend back to heaven, back to his Father, out of the disciples' sight. This is after his resurrection. He's going to go on to heaven where he's, Hebrews tells us, he's seated at his Father's right hand. And the, the disciples wanted to know before he left, because he had told them, remember, and we read in John 14, 
I'm going to my father's house to prepare a place for you. And then I'm coming back to get you. They wanted to know about the start of the kingdom. You talk so much about the kingdom to us. And he did over and over and over about the kingdom. And yet you were crucified. <coughs> Excuse me. You were resurrected. The kingdom's not yet started. When you come back and establish your kingdom, when is that going to be? Is that going to be soon? And they were asking about the start of his kingdom. That's what anybody would have thought. It says there in Acts chapter 1, it says, When they had come together, they asked him, this is in verses 6 and 7, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? And he said to them, You know what, guys? It's not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. I'm not going to tell you that don't you worry about when. Someone said the general pattern of biblical re revelation is that the one just doesn't know when Scripture is fulfilled until it is. Predictions ahead of time are almost always wrong. So, question, should our focus be centered on the second coming? Should that be what we're all, all charged up about all the time and that's all we think about? Someone said long ago, I heard the, the expression, don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Should our focus be on, on the return of Christ? Should it, we always, we'd be walking around all the time looking in the clouds. I don't think so. I remember the years <clears throat> of the spiritual awakening in this country called the Jesus Movement in the early 1970s. I was a teenager uh, living in the epicenter, if you will, of that movement in Southern California. And one of the leading pastors involved in that, that movement was Chuck Smith at Calvary Chapel. And so much of Pastor Chuck's preaching then was about the second coming. And it was an exciting time. People were being saved, droves of people all over the country. Songs were written about the return of Christ. I wish we'd all been ready. Christian films were being made about it. And, and those films... If you were a teenager back in those days, uh, you remember those films were staples at youth retreats. In 1970, two books came out that really began to fan the flames and stoke the fire. Salem Kirban wrote a book, a novel, entitled 666. It was a story about the events of the tribulation as he envisioned that they would be. Another author by the name of Hal Lindsey wrote a book called The Late Great Planet Earth, the number one bookseller in the 1970s, the late great planet Earth. And his book focused on current events. And he tied those current events as best he could in his interpretation by explaining the rebirth of the nation of Israel in 1948 and Jesus' prophecy of Matthew chapter 24, verse 34, where Jesus said this, I assure you, I guarantee this generation will certainly not pass until all these things take place. Well, Lindsay went through the Bible and he made a great case to explain that a generation in the Bible was 40 years. And so what that means, if you know simple math, 1948 plus 40 equals 1988. So his conclusion was that the rapture would happen by 1988. Guess what? He was wrong. It's a good book. But he was wrong. Another fellow followed up with a book called, nine, called 88 Reasons Why Jesus, Why the Rapture Will Happen in 1988. Some of you might remember that book. For, sold four and a half million copies. And when Jesus didn't come in 1988, he wrote a sequel to it. Uh, I, I can't remember the, the, the title of it. It was kind of like, oops, uh, l let's broaden that a little bit. Listen, if Jesus promised these things would happen, if they're prophesied in the Old Testament, which Jesus proclaimed, he said the Old Testament is the Word of God, the eternal Word of God. If they're proclaimed in the New Testament, then it must be true. Jesus is returning. I believe that with all my heart. You've heard me talk about it. I'm ready to go. I'm excited. I'm looking forward to it. Maybe today. But there's no way to know when it will be. I want you to listen. Please hear me. Listen to Jesus, please. Please listen to Jesus. Matthew 24, verse 36. Read this verse with me. Read it aloud, if you will. 
Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven nor the Son, except the Father only. Talking about his coming back, he just talked about Noah and all those things. He said, listen, nobody knows. He said to them, I don't even know when that's going to be. Only the Father knows. So to answer the question, can we know when he'll return? The answer, church, is no. So when someone makes a video and puts it on YouTube, puts it on Facebook, wherever it might show up, a video, and it goes viral, or someone writes a book complaining, comp- explaining that he's figured it out, he's got it down to the day. And almost always, as I said, it's going to be in September, October. When somebody says, I've got it figured out, I've gone through all the Bible, I've decoded and, and deciphered all the, all the prophecies in the Bible, and here's when it's going to be, I know when it's going to pl- get, take place, please listen to me. Don't you get your shorts in a bunch. Don't do it. Why? Because he's wrong. In fact, by saying, I've figured it out, what he's really doing based upon what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, he's mocking Christ. Jesus said, nobody knows. The angels don't know. You can't know. He's mocking Christ by thinking he's that smart that it can be deciphered somehow. Do not be deceived in these last days. So let me finish up with one more question. This is the big question. Am I ready now for Christ's return? Mark chapter 4, verse 29 Jesus is teaching and he says this, but as soon as the crop is ready, he sends for the sickle because the harvest has come. Many interpret that scripture as saying that, and I, I, I have no reason to doubt that this is what it means, is saying that as soon as the last soul is saved. Paul says in the book of Titus that the gospel of grace will be proclaimed in every nation, to every people. As soon as the last soul is saved, Jesus will return for his church. And again, the emphasis is on being ready. Well, how, Rick, how can I be ready? I'm glad you asked that. You can be ready simply by knowing that you're in his family because you know there was a time in your life <clears throat> when you received Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm not talking about your baptism not talking about keeping the sacraments, not talking about attending a class, joining a church. I'm talking about an act of faith. When you realize that nothing could bring you forgiveness of sin and eternal life other than faith in Jesus Christ. And if we can help you here at Nags Head Church with that, if we can answer questions for you, if we can pray for you, would you please, please let us know. But if you haven't trusted Christ, you're not ready. I would love for you to be ready. And I can, we can add to that about being ready. Well, okay, I'm ready, Pastor Rick. I know that I am. Okay, how about my loved ones and my friends and my neighbors? Are they ready? Should be, today be the day? Because I could not answer that question. <clears throat> am I ready? I couldn't answer it. Yes. When I heard Pastor Kirk's sermons, I knew, however, I needed to be ready. Ready means being in Christ forever family. That means our friends and our loved ones, just like I did, just like you may have, with a childlike faith, believe in Jesus Christ to come and that he came and lived and died on a cross for my sins and to give me eternal life. And at that point in time in my life, I was born again. And since that day, since that time, I have never feared death because I know I was promised eternal life. Nor have I feared the return of Christ because I know I'm going to be taken up with him. So how about you? Are you ready? Bow with me in prayer, please. Father in heaven, thank you that there is so much in the Bible. From the Old Testament prophets, the Lord Jesus himself, the writers of the New Testament, The Apostle Paul, Peter, certainly John in the book of Revelation. All talking about Christ coming back. So we know it's true. We know it's going to happen. 
It's just a mystery to us because we don't know when. And certainly we can look at this world right now and say, I don't know if it's as bad as it was in Noah's day, Lord, but it's pretty bad. And we could say maybe this is the time, and maybe it is. But we don't know. So I pray, God, that we who are ready, that we will help others become ready as well by sharing the faith, by giving them the opportunity to hear the gospel and believe in Jesus as we have. And then I pray, uh, Father, that we would go about our lives and we would, as Jesus said, occupy till he comes. Be busy about serving you, about serving your church, about proclaiming the gospel. May we live in expectation that today might be the day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us. I'll see you next time.